Hello, and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is still true and directly applicable in our lives. If you would like to know more on what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Romans 10.9 is a verse that is taken out of context more often than not in the church today. In chapter 10, Paul expounds on the law of God, calling it the law of righteousness. So, let's review this chapter to gain understanding to the true meaning of verse 9. Ready? Verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is for their salvation. First, he addresses the readers as brethren, letting us know that the readers of this letter are already believers. He then declares that his desire and prayer for the physical Israel is their salvation. It must be noted here that the salvation mentioned is not regarding salvation by way of conversion, but rather being saved at the return of Christ. We'll cover this in detail a little later. Verse 2, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Paul clearly states that Israel has a zeal for God, but that their zeal is not in accordance with knowledge. Paul is saying that their zeal is not based on the knowledge that the Father had given them, the law the true foundation of knowledge. Are there any scriptures that would give us any indication of this? There are a few. Proverbs 1.7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, biblically speaking, what does it mean to fear the Lord? Deuteronomy 6.1 these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God. So, one could say that the biblical definition of knowledge that Paul is speaking of here is to fear the Lord. And to fear the Lord is to obey His commands as given in Deuteronomy. There are others that we could consider, but I think it's clear that Paul is simply saying that their zeal is not based on the knowledge that the Father had given them, the law, the true foundation of knowledge. This becomes more evident in the following verses. Verse 3, For not knowing about God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. This is exactly what Christ himself said regarding what the Pharisees and teachers of the law did in Mark 7. They clung to that which was passed down to them instead of the word of God. Mark 7. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You nicely set aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. He then says in verse 10, For Moses said, thus equating what Moses said to the commandment of God. And in verse 13, Christ also teaches us that what was written by Moses is the word of God. Verse 13, Thus, in validating the word of God, by your tradition which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So, they made their own righteousness instead of holding to that which the Word declares is righteousness. And what is that righteousness? Deuteronomy 6, And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as He commanded us, that will be our righteousness. So, obedience to the law is the righteousness 
that the Lord desires us to live out. Now some may quickly say, that was the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. To which I agree. So, does the New Testament ever equate the law for our righteousness? Well, a little later we will clearly see that this very chapter calls it the righteousness that is by faith. The faith that we are to walk by. Some others are Romans chapter 2. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. 1 John 3, 7 Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Biblically speaking, what does it mean here in 1 John to do what is right? Well, in keeping with biblical definitions, Deuteronomy 6, 17 be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and stipulations and decrees He has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you, and you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. And Deuteronomy 12:28. Be careful to obey all these regulations I am giving you, so that it may always go well with you and your children after you, because you will be doing what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord your God. It must be noted that 1 John speaks much about obedience to the law. So, the righteousness we are to seek is God's righteousness. Can you think of a verse where Christ himself said this? Matthew 6:33 But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the exact same Greek word for righteousness as Paul uses in verse 3. Let's go back to verse 3 and read it again and refresh where we are at. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The problem back then and today is that man tries to make his own righteousness. More often than not, it comes from the previous church fathers, just like that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did. We forget, though, that the Lord declares our righteousness as filthy rags through Isaiah. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like a wind our sins sweep us away. Yet this is what Israel was doing. They were substituting their righteousness for God's righteousness. And this is what Paul is talking about here in verse 3. That Israel had completely set aside the law given to them true righteousness and focused on the traditions passed down to them their own righteousness. Paul continues on track with this topic in verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is where the church begins to misrepresent Paul. They use this verse to say that Paul is saying Christ did away with the law. If this is the case then Paul himself is contradicting the very words of Christ. For Christ did say, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. For a further study on this verse, see our abolish or fulfill teaching. But do remember the phrase, until heaven and earth pass away. We'll come back to that a little later. Paul here in verse 4 is simply saying that Christ is the end of the law, not by way of abolishing it, but by way of completing it. Just like Revelation is the end of the Bible, Christ is the end of the law. And just as Revelation didn't do away with all of the rest of Scripture, 
Christ did not do away with the law. The Greek word for end is telos. It means the end by way of being the goal. This will all make sense in a moment, simply because the verses following verse 4 shows the exact opposite of what the church claims Paul is talking about. The next verse is where Paul starts showing that the law is still alive and well. Verse 5, For Moses writes that the man who practices righteousness, which is based on the law, shall live by that righteousness. Live by that righteousness. Live is a verb, simply meaning to do, put in action, to actually live out that righteousness. We cannot ignore the righteousness that Paul is speaking of here is the righteousness that Moses wrote. Paul is speaking of the same righteousness referred to in verse 3. What is that righteousness? For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Thus, the Pharisees and teachers of the law may have been preaching the righteousness of God, the law, but they simply were reading it and then doing their own laws. They weren't living it. Even Christ told his disciples, Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. The Lord desires us to live the law, God's righteousness, from our heart, from an inward desire to love God and not just obey it. Verse 5 is where Paul is expounding on a quote from Leviticus 18.5. Keep my decrees and laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. This was the very righteousness of God that they were supposed to be living. The same righteousness that Christ said we should seek. The righteousness of God that was given through Moses. Next, in verse 6, we find Paul quoting from Deuteronomy. Before we read Paul's words, let's look at the verses he actually quotes from in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart, so you may obey it. These verses are referencing the law that Moses gave. Now, let's read from Paul in verses 6 through 8. Remember, these next three verses, Paul quotes from these verses in Deuteronomy regarding God's law, not man's law or even supposed new law of God in the New Testament. It must be noted also that the Greek version of the first word given in the next verse is day. It's a conjunction that simply means and, but, or now, pending the interpreter's view. And in this case, the interpreter's view of the law and how it relates to us today. Any interpreter who believes the law has been done away with will be more apt to separate the righteousness mentioned in the quote of Leviticus from the righteousness that is by faith as mentioned in the next verse. But you are about to see how these verses are referring to the same righteousness that comes through the law, the exact same. So in reading Paul's quote from Deuteronomy, we're going to show the Greek words with their meanings where the interpreters place the word but, and we'll let you decide which matches the context best. So, here's Paul's quote. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or 
who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But, what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith we are proclaiming. So, Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy regarding the law, the law of righteousness that is by faith. He declares it right here. The word of faith that Paul was proclaiming was the law. This should make complete sense because Christ is the word made flesh. This text clearly proves that verse 5 and 6 are speaking of the same law and should be referenced as such and not in a manner of separating them. When we try to separate these verses from referring to the same law, the law of God through Moses, as the context clearly shows, we bring confusion and are forced to create a new law that simply does not exist. Many at this point will refer to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. First, the Greek doesn't say the law. The Greek simply says law, leaving the context to show which law is being spoken of, which is man's law, as established in verse 6, in the same chapter, starting from verse 3. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. This is the law where he said he was blameless or faultless. Yet, we know that Paul said regarding God's law, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Establishing the fact that no one can be blameless to God's law but Christ alone. Yet, one could be perfect to man's law, as was Paul's testimony to the Philippians here in chapter 3. It was those very things that Paul considered a loss compared to knowing Christ in verse 7 and long for the righteousness from God which is based on faith as mentioned in verse 9. Having said that, let's read the last verse again and continue on where we were. But, what does it say? The word is near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, that is, the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Again, this is what was said regarding the law, the righteousness that is by faith, declared here by Paul. The word of faith that Paul was proclaiming was the law. Not man's law, but God's law. And we must remember that Paul is already talking to believers here, as mentioned in verse 1. He even includes them in verse 8 as to what they are all proclaiming. So, he is not talking about conversion here. He is talking about the salvation that comes to believers at the second coming. How do we know this? Well, all of the texts must be used for context. Let's briefly look four verses down at verse 13. Verse 13 is a quote from Joel 2.32. Verse 13 says, For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, let's look at Joel 2.32 along with the previous verse for the context of the quote. Joel 2.31 the sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, 
as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So, the context that Paul is talking about is all about being saved at the second coming. So then, just what is verse 9 saying to us? Let's look at it again. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 9 follows the quote from Deuteronomy regarding the righteousness that is by faith. The law. Paul is revealing to us the mystery of how Christ is the living law, by way of being the living word, and how the law was and is in Christ, just as the word was and is in Christ. Christ also said that he was life. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are there any other definitions of life in the scriptures? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death blessings and curses. Let's pause here for a moment. Earlier in this teaching, I referred to a phrase and asked you to remember it. Remember what it was? It was Matthew chapter 5, where Christ said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. So why would Christ say this? Because, as given here in Deuteronomy, they are the witnesses to the law being established until the new heaven and earth. Let's read that verse one more time, and then we'll continue on with our definitions of life. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, God is declared as life. So, biblically speaking, Christ is life and God is life. What other definitions of life do we have? Well, just a couple of chapters later, Deuteronomy chapter 32, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So, now we see the law is declared life. Christ, God, and the law are all defined as life in the scriptures. When you accept Christ, you accept life. Thus, you are accepting God and the law. They are completely synonymous with each other. This is being born again, because you are proclaiming Christ, who is and gives life, the living law, Torah. So that which is life, gives life. Living the law is not your salvation. Living the law is the proof of your salvation because the Spirit has placed the law in your heart. This is nothing new, just true. Consider even the conversation between Christ and Nicodemus. John chapter 3, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. 
You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Notice how Christ is surprised at Nicodemus. Christ is not presenting anything new. This is straight from the scriptures. In fact, verse 13 of John is a direct referral to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 20. Let's look at it. John 3, 13. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him, life, law, God, may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, the law, life, shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son, the living law, life, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, the living law, life. Does this sound foreign to you? Allow me to remind you where your salvation comes from. 1 Peter 1.23 For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. It's not the changing Word of God, or even partial Word of God. It's the enduring Word of God. Again, living the law is not your salvation. Living the law is the proof of your salvation. Because that which is in you, Christ, the law, by way of Jeremiah 31, 33, and Ezekiel 36, 27, will come out of you. If you plant an apple seed, you get an apple tree. When you plant the Word, Christ, the living law, in you, you get the Word, Christ, the living law, out of you. Like kind produces like kind. Let's continue with verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Ever heard the phrase, the proof is in the pudding? This is exactly what Paul is saying. He knows that when one truly has the word in his heart, that it will come out of his mouth, and then the rest will follow. It's a direct referral to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. Christ himself said in Luke 6, 45, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. When the word is truly in you, it will come out of you, showing forth that the living law is proof of your salvation. We must remember that it is to be in our heart and in our mouth. There are examples where it came out of mouths simply for a show, but was not in the heart. Thus, obedience did not follow. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. My people come to you, as they usually do, and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. True obedience starts in the heart and works its way out. Paul then continues. As the scripture says, Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Does that sound familiar? It should. Numbers 15 verse 15. The community is to have the same rules for you and the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien shall be the same before the Lord. Back to Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As mentioned earlier, this is a direct referral to Joel chapter 2, 
regarding the return of Christ. Verse 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news about what? This is a quote from Isaiah 52 verse 7. 52 verse 8 shows that the topic here is the Lord's return to Zion. Again, his second coming. Continuing on, verse 16. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, was faith required back then? Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 specifically tells us that it was the lack of faith that kept the first generation under Moses out of the promised land. Think about that for a moment. The lack of faith kept them out of the promised land. Let's read it. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. As just has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, broke the law, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed the law? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Please notice that unbelief is equated here with disobedience to the law. So, how is this the case? Because one who believes and confesses is one who walks in obedience. Obedience is the proof of one's faith. In this case, it was the proof of their lack of faith. So, was faith required back then? Yes, it was. Faith has always been required of the Father. Consider even these words of Paul just three verses before chapter 10. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith? But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Please note, faith was the stumbling stone. Continuing on, just as it was written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. The righteousness that the Father established was and is to be pursued in faith. Let's continue. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Speaking of faith, let's continue on with our text, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Whose voice has gone out? This is a quote from Psalm 19. The context in this psalm is the heavens declaring the glory of God. 
Why is this of any significance? Because this is regarding the witnesses, heaven and earth, declaring God's law till a new heaven and earth come. Continuing on, again I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. Why would Israel be envious or even angry at another nation or people? Only because those people are following the Lord according to the ways he first gave to them. Continuing on. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. This was the whole purpose of Paul's journeys, to spread the good news to the Gentiles, the nations. They didn't ask for it, but it was being declared to them. And concluding, But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Disobedient to what? The law. So does he do away with the law so they won't be disobedient anymore? Not at all. The very ones who rejected Christ at his first advent were the very ones who rejected the law and were following their own. So Romans 10.9 is not about conversion or a prayer of salvation, but it's all about living the life of God's righteousness, which is established in faith, the law. We hope you've enjoyed this study. Remember, continue to test everything. Shalom.